I think it would be a good idea just to answer probably the most direct question that I found out there, which is, does content marketing work? I wouldn't be sitting here now without it. But I read a book on the train last night that um, dismissed the phrase and um, argued that it's all part of your copy strategy and it should be part of your overall strategy rather than a buzzword thing. So, yeah. Yes, it does work. I couldn't agree more. So the question is, and you're going to laugh at this, but what do you mean by work? And what do you mean by content marketing? So if you, if you try and tag on something called content marketing, we'll have some of that, and you haven't factored in uh, it into your strategy and you haven't thought about what you're trying to achieve from it, then it probably won't work. Yes, and I think that leads onto another question that needs to be asked, uh, or something that needs to be addressed that I see a lot with companies. They think a content marketing strategy is producing a press release every couple of weeks, mm. pushing that out on social media, and that's it, we're doing content marketing. I would argue, <laughs> <laughs> from, the, from the other corner, I would argue I have no strategy whatsoever. I just like talking to people and I like um, interacting with people and I write absolute nonsense. I think appropriate for each platform, but there's no strategy. I don't have a calendar on the wall that goes, right, today we're going to be talking about copyright and today we're going to be talking about direct sales. There's none of that. Um, and I think it almost works for me because there isn't that. And I, t I took some advice from a, a content marketing expert um, who, and I, my complaint was everybody's already written, you know, how to write a sales letter, how to write a homepage, and they've done it better than I ever could. So what do I do instead? And, um, and she said, you know lots of people, go and interview them. So that's what I do instead. But for me, it's a natural part of the day. I'm on my phone, I'm checking all of the platforms multiple times a day because it's part of how I keep up with the world. Whereas I suppose if you're a solicitor or if you're an accountant or you're in a, in a space that's not about communication, then you're busy working on your job, not around your job. So I think one of the things content marketing does is it offers something of value to people and it gives them an opportunity to encounter you. And so I think that's probably what is working for you, Catherine, that you might not have sat down and, and come up with a strategy, you know, today I'm going to write, you know, how to be Dostoevsky and then I'm going to look at Dickens. You, you've not put that kind of strategy, but actually you have one consistent strategy, which is you're going to be yourself yes. on social media and people are going to encounter that mm. and, uh, and you're going to find people who, who need what you offer. Yeah. And I think that is the most important thing. You have to offer something of value, but then you have to genuinely put yourself out there as, in, as a business, your identity, your brand, your values, what you offer, what's unique about you in such a way so that there's that moment of recognition when, you're, when your customer or client reads what you've written or sees what you've put out there and thinks, that is what I need. Mm. Yeah. And I don't think you can get that any other way. No, um, I, I, I would fully agree with that. I think the, the key thing that you mentioned there for me was, was offering something of value. Again, I, I go back to the example that I see often, which is putting out press releases or, or news stories. I find that they often offer very little value to the person. Most people are go onto the internet other than to watch cat videos or random other videos on YouTube. That they're, <laughs> they're on there to find answers to questions. Yes. So the more you can find out what those questions are and provide the answers to them, the more valuable your content's going to be, the more people are going to want to read it, engage with it, and the better it's going to look for your company. And that's something businesses do rightly all the time when it comes to their product, right? So what does my product have to offer to my um, customer, the end user? What's unique about it? Why would they want it? But actually, if you leave that behind when it comes to your marketing, you, you won't be successful. You have to put yourself in, in your client's shoes and ask, what is this going to benefit? How can this benefit them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's true. In fact, I sent, I sent a piece this morning. I'm doing some work with a woman who does, um, she does leadership coaching and she's also developing a program for the maternity transition for businesses that are terrified about getting the, the rules wrong and also um, new mums, you know, 
life has turned ups upside down, now what? And people that are in quite a senior role and it's going to shift their whole life. And then there was a piece in The Guardian this morning about basically the, the, the pram in the hall stopping mothers reaching their full potential. So I sent it to her and just went, if you have the headspace and the time, because she has a baby, get this on LinkedIn and start a conversation. Even if she can't, the website's not ready yet. There's no point putting it on the website. But even if it gets out there and she starts that conversation, because it helps to position herself mm -hmm. where she is. So it's finding those new stories around that actually are relevant and build a picture without being in your face salesy. Yeah, that, that, that's the key side of it as well, isn't it? Is not, not using content purely to sell. Yeah. And I think that's another stumbling block for a lot of companies as well as they want such a quick response to the work that they're putting out there, the content they're putting out there, that they'll feel that they maybe have to sell a little bit too hard yes. within the content without thinking, actually, this is likely to be a long-term process yeah. and I should maybe think long-term and actually just try and provide an insane amount of value through all the content I'm producing. And through that, naturally, people will start to learn about your business and if they do want the services that you offer, at, at a specific time, you'll be front of mind because you provide them with all this value. Yeah. And there's that fantastic sense of reciprocity that people have when someone's done them a favor, mm. whether that's in face-to-face -face done a favor or you've been reading someone's content and they've been given fantastic answers to questions you've been wanting answers to and you've applied all that stuff to your business and it's worked out, you are far more likely to want to engage with that company. Yeah. It's trust as well, isn't it? You're yeah. building trust that you're going to come through and deliver what you say you can deliver. Yeah. Um, and also, do you think there's something in what is, what do we mean by content marketing? Because I, I think you would think off the top of your head it's blogs yeah. and posts linked to your, the hub of your website. But it's also sales letters and funnels and social media and it's a much bigger Video. machine and videos. I need to wink to camera. Um, it's a much bigger machine than it was even five years ago. And will shift again. You know, there's a lot of people from this area that are now over at Social Media Marketing World, whatever it's called in San Diego, and they're all about immersive tech and VR, having watched Instagram stories, yet more content marketing this morning. Yeah. So it's shifting. It's a good space to be in, it's exciting. Yeah. I, I really share the the um, the move away from everything salesy. Right. Yeah. That's that's the thing to avoid, I think. And I think it gets back to the old distinction between pathos, ethos, and logos in rhetoric. Mm. So when you're speaking, there's logos, there's the rationale of what you're saying. There's the pathos, the persuasiveness of what you're saying. And then there's the ethos, which is the credibility of you as the speaker. Mm. And I think what we're saying, I think we're pretty agreed, is that it's the, the, the pathos, that persuasiveness, um, I mean, it's come into our, our everyday use in terms of pulling on people's heartstrings, but mm. that, that's the salesiness. That's the thing where you say, and you finish with a hard sell at the end. That's the thing where you say, let's, let's ease off on that. Let's focus on building your credibility as, as, a, as a brand, as an organization, that you know what you're doing, that your product is rooted in innov innovation, or, or your product is really able to do what it, it can do. But, but it's not because you're persuading people. Mm. It's because you're establishing the foundation that means that people can trust you yes which unless you have the opportunity to meet someone face to face and develop a relationship with them over a long period of time is a very difficult thing to build up and that's why i feel high quality content marketing there's a distinction between just doing it and doing it well that's where that can in really fast forward a relationship with somebody mm -hmm. if they see that you know your stuff and that you're as i said before answering their questions the level of trust they'll begin to build with your brand is mm -hmm. is so much higher so that if you do ever have that interaction with them, maybe they get in touch via email or a phone call or you see them at an event, they're already aware of who you are, what you do, and, and that you are a trustworthy or relatively trustworthy as much as you can ever know about mm -hmm. a company. Yeah. But I think that's very interesting. The classical version of basically what is the, the ADA, ADCA, attention, interest, desire, conviction, action is rooted in, it's all psychology, isn't it? And it's basically presenting yourself or your business in words or video or infographic or however as somebody that's decent, somebody that might be nice to work with and that isn't going to muck you about, mm -hmm. somebody that knows what they're talking about and will deliver what they say they're going to deliver when they say they're going to deliver it. 
that's all we want, really. Yeah. You know. I think it's really tied to being genuine, mm. and so and the, I think the best content marketing will be it will be genuine. It will accurately portray a brand or an individual, and you'll get a sense that you know who they are. Yeah. And when you actually meet them, you think this is so completely the same person I was reading yeah. about. Yeah. Um, whereas if you get that wrong mm. in the desire to manipulate people or put a facade up, um, it's obviously, it's, it's, it's dubious morally, and it's also counterproductive because it won't work. Yeah. You'll end up, you, you'll, you, you might get lots of leads, but they won't, they'll, they'll, ne they'll never yeah. turn into clients, and they certainly won't be satisfied no. because they, the whole thing happened under a misapprehension. So I, I, th I think genuineness is something we want, and it means content marketing is going to become, uh, it, it, it's on its way up. Mm. We, we want genuine relationships, not just with our friends, but with the businesses we deal with. Mm. And when you catch someone out on, and saying something that doesn't match what they're mm. actually like, and that social media is, so, so, is full of that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. People engaging with an airline or a retail store or something, and calling them out this is what you did to me. It yeah. didn't match who you, who you say you are. Yeah. Uh, and that's why it's such a big problem, because it highlights a lack of genuineness, mm. which is the flip side. So content marketing is an opportunity to, to show your, your real self. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with that in mind, can you think of any companies in particular that are doing content marketing well? I think somebody that does it really well when we're talking about content marketing is Chris Brogan. And... Um, he sends an email on a Sunday morning and it starts with, hi, how are you? What are you drinking? I'll be drinking a kombucha tea or a bullet coffee or something. And then he always asks for, you know, shout back in the comments. Mm. And if you shout back in the comments, which I do occasionally, he replies. Yeah. So that guy must spend all Sunday sitting, waiting for his international mailing list. But I buy his products, I've bought his books, I've bought his courses. And he feels like a friend. And if I was at an event and Chris Brogan was there, I would mainline to go and see him and say thank you for basically showing me how to do it in a cool and pleasant way. I think that's a, that's a key part of content marketing now, isn't it? That interaction that you have with people, whether that's on social media and companies that set up de dedicated social media teams just to mm -hmm. reply to people's issues or a really engaging email, yeah. which is replied to. I know... Um, I'm not sure if he does it so much anymore, but I think the reason Gary Vaynerchuk got as big as he did was in the early stages, he would reply to every single tweet that he got, any mm. message he got on social media. I don't think he's probably got the time to do that anymore. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, he, he was, and he, I know he's mentioned several times, that was so key to him growing this fan base of people who are loyal to what he yeah. says. Uh, so that interaction that you have is key now and that is a huge part of content marketing mm. so it's not just a blog yeah. it's how do you interact with your customers on a yeah. regular basis for me the company that stood out for over a decade i think is um compare the market mm. they've turned a group of cgi meerkat characters into a cult a cult <laughs> sorry are you saying that they're cgi this is really disillusioning. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were being serious for a second. <laughs> um, yeah, they are CGI, yeah. Um, I just thought that for they, they never, or very, very, it's like with the last sentence of the adverts that they put on is compare, I don't even know if they do that anymore. I think they used I'm to, sure didn't they? They had they? compare the market at the end of their adverts, but now it's just stories about these meerkat characters yeah it's, it's nothing to do with their product at all and yet it's everyone knows it everybody could reference the company and i would guarantee anyone that's looking to compare anything will go there first just because of this story that they've built up and i, I can't imagine that was an easy sell whoever came up with that idea yeah. we're not going to talk about the product at all we're going to invent these meerkat characters because it kind of sounds like market <laughs> and we're going to see what happens we'll see where yes. it goes yeah no, right, give it a go it, it, it worked out all right for them in the end but I, I think it depends what sector you're looking at. So, I, I mean, I could give, so for example, in the software as a service, if you, have you heard of DigitalOcean, the uh, cloud uh, provider? So they provide um, virtual servers, they manage databases, all kinds of things like that. And they are probably the most well-known 
uh, in their sector. So they're not the Amazon or the Google, but they are um, they're, they're just under that. And the way they became number one is that they put out tutorials on every possible uh, pr problem you might have from a server administration point of view. So that I, this is very specific, but mm. it, it, it got to the point where if you had a problem, if you needed to know how to set up X software platform on a server, you'd Google and the top result is always going to be DigitalOcean. Uh, and, and basically, it establishes that they know what they're talking about. Mm. Um, so I, I, if, I would, if, if I had to estimate their direct return on investment, I would think it would be, um, it would be phenomenal mm. b because they, they've built this trust mm. over years with a community of, of developers mm. who basically know that they, they can trust DigitalOcean. Yeah. And then they also used to, to bury little secret dis discount codes in articles, which I suppose didn't help, didn't hurt either. Yeah. I think the other thing for that as well, which is a, an overlooked aspect, is that when you put that piece of content out, I, can't, I don't know how long ago they wrote it, but that's still working for them now. Yeah. You turn off the, the, uh, the PPC advertising, you stop advertising in a magazine, then that's it. Yeah. It, it, it goes out and does that thing for the time that you put it out there. Content works as long as the, the, the content is relevant, which if I was given advice to companies, it'd be try and make every everything you write or everything you film or whatever is as evergreen as possible, yeah. so that it continues to work for you when you're not working. And that that's getting back to that concept of value that we were talking about earlier. That by offering something of value, you gain something that carries on working for you long after yeah. um, you've written it. Unlike your puff piece or your your press release or your that that your moment of personal fame yeah. that vanishes yes. pretty quickly. Yeah. There's a consumer brand as well, you just reminded me actually, Daniel, the um, B&Q do brilliant, actually, content marketing, because they'll do a video about how to, I don't know, repressurize your boiler or drain a radiator or paint a wall. But around that, I used it in a training course recently, around that they'll give you top tips on what other paint colours you might need to use and what soft furnishings we might have. So it leads you, almost like Ikea does, takes you through what's on offer without any hard sell whatsoever because it feels like you're being helped. But, and as well, it's always how to, which as we all know is complete link bait. Um, how to drain the radiator, how to da 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 da. But nicely done, mm -hmm. nicely done. In a, and, and it is authentic. And I think that's where it all stemmed from, isn't it? And I remember listening to Copy Blogger podcasts years ago and talking about, I think it was Hilton had, Ask Hilton. So wherever you are in the world, if it's still going, you could go onto Twitter and Ask Hilton. So the example they gave was somebody was on holiday, their dog needed a vet, they couldn't get hold of anybody, it was three in the morning, so they tweeted Ask Hilton and Ask Hilton. We're like, oh yes, the 24 hour vet around the corner, ask for John. And then, you know, so where you go on holiday again, where are you gonna stay? Hmm, it's all clever. That's it. It's just, uh, and it, it's working out as well. I think what each piece of content, whatever it is you do, you, what do you want it to do when it goes out there? I know you mentioned earlier that sometimes you, you don't necessarily have a, a huge strategy in place, but I think that from the nature of what you do, mm. someone who writes content and produces content a lot. For everybody else. <laughs> you know you're doing it. I think for companies yeah. maybe who know they should be doing it and I think it's key to make sure that every piece of content that you create is going out there to achieve something, whether that's to educate, whether that's to inspire, mm. whatever it is. And, and how do you track if it's doing that as well? Yeah. So that you can make sure the next piece of content that you produce is doing the job better. Yeah. It's not just, I think, producing content for the sake of it, which is often done. Mm. It's actually, what is that going to do when it goes out there? And how are you going to measure whether or not it's actually doing that? Yeah, it's the why, so isn't it? Why yeah. are you putting it out there? I wonder if it's maybe worth spending a few minutes on, on maybe how you both track content and see how it, it works for either your clients or yourselves. I know that I did a massive push on International Women's Day because um, so my, my blog is sometimes I'll be talking about things that occur to me, very random. I, in fact, I had an idea on the train last night. That'll get written in about three months' time. But I have a set feature, which is called the writing desk, which is copywriters, creatives, answering a series of questions. They go down a storm on social media. 
and I realized because I've been so busy that I was behind. So I actually spoke to a very good friend um, who I trust implicitly, Vicky Ross, who's a copywriter down in London. I was like, Vicky, I've got this backlog, what am I going to do? And she just said, why don't you, for International Women's Day, celebrate all the women that you've got already on the site. So I've got um, Joanna Weeb from Copy Hackers is on there, Claudia Benatello is in Italy. All these amazing women writing, earning fortunes of money, doing what they're brilliant at. Um, so I gathered every interview that I hadn't already published by a woman and put them all out on Twitter. And I think it's gone well because I had an inquiry from a massive pharmaceutical company this week that probably found me because my site's gone nuts, I would imagine. So tracking, sometimes I look at Google Analytics, sometimes I don't. I'm, I'm, there's a conversation going on, isn't there? We've just had this conversation about the fact I'm all over Twitter all the time, uttering nonsense, but it is genuine nonsense and a little bit of outrage and a little bit political and then I have to rein myself in and not be quite so sweary and yeah, how do I measure it? I don't. I know that if I write for you then it gets tracked properly <laughs> but my own stuff it's whether it gets talked about I suppose. Yeah. But there's no little chart, there's no spreadsheet, heaven help me. But no. I don't think that necessarily has to be. I think sometimes are you having engagements with people on Twitter? Are you having conversations with people based on content that you're putting out there? Yeah. Is that what you deem a success for your tweets or the piece of content that you're sharing? I think for a lot of people that is. It's a it's a networking opportunity, isn't it? I know there's a lot of um, hashtag clubs that run on Twitter at different times mm. and they're very useful uh, networking opportunities. I think sometimes it, it can be as, as simple as I'm going to put this out there and I just want to see how much engagement I get. Mm. Sometimes it can be views, it can be click-throughs, it can be downloads. I don't know yourself how you track it's, them. It's really tricky, I think, because it's not just about track, getting a metric. It's about knowing how to interpret that metric. Mm. And you get the classic problem when people look at their website analytics, just in general, and they see a bar going like this. But what, do, what does that mean? Are those, is that that's yeah. just you at home refreshing the page? Yeah. Is that... Um, sort of bots crawling your website is that people looking for a job with your company mm. Mm. You, 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 there are so many different categories of what that might be so interpreting them yeah. is a is a really key thing and it's important to to get that right um, so I but I, I think it goes back to what you're saying James determine the purpose for what you're doing so if, the, if your purpose is to build relationships rather than uh, to drive a particular pound figure, then you're going to measure that in a different way. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're measuring that with engagement or you're measuring that with conversations uh, or, or you, you're, maybe you're me measuring that by, by, by um, running a, a little a panel or a focus group and asking them ab about how it's going. If, if, you're aim if you have an, some e-commerce site and you can directly track yeah. Uh, clicks through to your website that then lead to, to purchases, well, that, that, that's a dream, isn't it? Because mm. you, you get an immediate return on investment. Yeah. So we spent this much and guess what? People bought this as a result. That's wonderful. But it's harder when it comes to soft, to softer things like, well, by putting this out, people understand more about what we do so that in six months' time, they recommend us to someone else. That's very difficult yeah. to measure. Yeah, and I imagine <coughs> it depends very much on if you're in charge of doing content or marketing for a company, who it is above you, who you're talking to, who is able to either understand and appreciate that or not. I imagine in some yeah. traditional industries, it's very difficult to push through a, a lengthy, innovative content marketing campaign. Those companies might just be used to paying for advertising or putting out press releases and mm -hmm. they don't see how you could maybe manage to track or see the effectiveness of a content marketing campaign that goes over 12 months and includes mm -hmm. video and webinars and all sorts of stuff like that. So I guess that comes into it in a big way, where do you work and who it is you're reporting to. Um, but also, I think it's, it's really key to say it again, just make sure that you understand why it is you've, you've created that piece of content in the first place because that will naturally inform how you measure it afterwards to see how effective it's, it's been. I, I think an help, a helpful analogy, perhaps, if you're trying to justify 
or you want to understand what a com content marketing campaign is actually doing. Because you can look at it from the perspective of it's taking X much time or this much budget. And what we're getting is articles or tweets or video content. That's a very misleading way of looking at it, I think. It's, I, I almost think ab about it like it, it's like having somebody on your team who goes out uh, and talks to every single person who reads that article or engages with it. It's, it's, it's a representation of you. And it's basically like networking. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's delivering something. Of, so what do you do when, you, when you're networking? You're meeting nice people. They're meeting you. You're trying to help them in some way. And you're not trying to um, force what you do on them. You're trying to help them. And that's what your content is doing as well, mm -hmm. except it has the potential of doing it not to that group of 20 or having a bacon butty whom you've all talked <laughs> to before, <laughs> but that person effectively goes to a, my analogy is breaking down now, but the, the audience is an ever increasing one yes. because if it's evergreen and it's unlimited because anyone can access it if it's available digitally. Uh, and so, so you, you, you have a permanent part of your team representing you digitally. Yeah. And I, I, if you start thinking about it like that, yeah. I think it, it becomes a much easier, it, it's, it's doing the same thing, but it's, it's doing it in a, in a way that can multiply the, the, the time you've put into it. And if you try and, I guess, compare that to how much it might cost to have someone who's out 24 seven talking to as many people as possible, mm. you'll start to see how cost effective yeah. producing good content can be yeah. if it's doing that job of, of representing your company well for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's when it, yeah, you really start to see the value of it. It's asking as well, isn't it? I think that's another thing I've started to do, which is how did you hear about me? How did you find me? And I did, I've done a lot of work for an agency down in um, Lancashire and we were having coffees over lunch with, with the client. It's like, why, why, why are you shipping me down from Newcastle to come for these great meetings? <laughs> and the, um, one of the directors just went, oh, you're at that thing, I liked it. I can't tell you how valuable that thing has been, yeah. but I would never have got in front of them without that. Mm. Not in a million years. And I think that's maybe where, going back to how do you measure the success of something, where maybe people don't do that enough. Mm. Because it can be quite difficult to... It's not very British, is it, to go... No. So how do you find us? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But if you don't ask the question, I guess, sometimes it can be really difficult. I mean, if you've written something for a publication, mm. a tangible hard copy magazine, and someone gets in touch and doesn't tell you that they saw you in that magazine, you'll yeah. never know if that actually led to anything. So asking, I guess, is a huge part of it. Yeah. Because sometimes it's really hard to trace. I find it would be almost impossible to trace something coming from a publication unless someone actually tells you. It's that vouch thing, is it's that the old school direct response. Yes. You know, mention this code, ten percent off. Da, 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 and yeah, but that can be unless you've got the right product and you're selling to the. Right, that can yeah. be. A, you know, most companies don't want to go down that route. Yeah, mention codename Panda. <laughs> codename Panda sounds good though. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think obviously digitally, it's much easier to trace. You see who's visited your website, you see which link they clicked on to get there. You know that piece of content has led to them engaging with your website for however long they were. And then did they do anything afterwards? You can set up all the different KPIs to track all that stuff. Mm. So that a aspect of asking, you know, I guess another one would be at, a, at an event. If you did a, stood up and did a, a talk, someone might leave and then yeah. get in touch with you six months later because they remembered how good you were at that talk. They might never tell you that. Yeah. And you don't know what's come from that. So it is a really useful aspect of, make, of, of working out how powerful a content marketing campaign or something that you've done within your content marketing campaign has been yeah. just purely by asking people why or how yeah. uh, like they find speaking out about works. you. Speaking works. I had yeah. an inquiry this morning from a speaker just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And that again proves it. You know, that was a two weeks ago. A lot of people are thinking about it at the time of, you know, you, I'm, I'm imagining that people go to an event, they come back, their boss might go, did you get any leads from it? Yeah. Like, well, maybe not in the two hours that I spent there, but I developed relationships and in six months time that might work out to be yeah. hugely yeah. beneficial. So again, it's just applying that longer term thinking to it. And that will depend on what kind of product or service you're, you, you have. Um, is it something that people need in the moment? Mm. So they, they 
uh, they don't, might not necessarily have had any engagement with your, your brand before, but they are searching, they find an article, they see a tweet, that's what they need, they act then and there. Um, or is it the kind of thing where it's all about trust? So consultancy, for example, is probably, it's all about trust and that's something it takes a long time to build. Yeah. So you, you tend not to see, it's not that someone Googles uh, you know, process consultancy and then the first result that comes up they, they engage with, yeah. um, they'll, they'll, they'll read the articles, they'll search for quite a lot of things and then and maybe they've been in the background aware of something on LinkedIn, but it was never relevant to them until that moment when it was. Yes, yes. And then it, it, the penny drops. Yeah. And so, but but that, that's sector-based, that's industry-based. So I think your, your KPIs need to reflect that. But I think that's, a, that's an important point as well, just to, that someone might not be in the, at the right stage in the buying cycle when they engage with your content the first time around, but then down the line when they do suddenly have that need for that service. Mm. It's all that good stuff you've been putting out there that keeps your company front of mind for it. Yeah. And Which is why as well it always needs to be, in fact that's a really good point, it always needs to be linked to your website. Yeah. And I'm guilty, my, my to-do list has the things that I've done recently that are noteworthy need to be talked about on my website because I'll very happily put them on Twitter, put them on LinkedIn and then they've gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually they need to be on that hub and then spread from the hub, which, you know, do as I say, not as I do. It's that thing of, it's almost like a digital business card, isn't it? So if I give you my card, you disappear, and we've had a conversation face to face because we've met for the first time today, but I might have read something that you'd written and be like, oh, okay, if I need your services, then you're front of mind because you've told me a story. It's that old school storytelling, isn't it, as well? It's very primitive. Um, we like hearing about other people and what not to do and what to do. Well, on that, is there anything that you think companies, it's an absolute no-no when it comes to their content marketing? I know that a lot of that will probably depend on sector, but there must be a few things that we can think of which are, don't ever do that. And likewise, or on the flip side, are there any things that companies really should be doing when they're thinking of mm -hmm. implementing a content marketing campaign or that they could be making changes to? Be consistent. Don't have a blog from 2016 and then nothing else. Mm. I think that's the biggest. If you're not going to blog, stick to it. Don't have a blog. Yeah. If you are going to blog, yeah. blog. Even if it's just once a month, blog. And it doesn't have to be massive. Or just could show even. that you're there and you're functioning. Yeah. That's my biggest bugbear. I think that puts me straight off. I think that's that's just that seems to be that's the byproduct of companies that don't necessarily know what it is they're doing when it comes to their content. Yeah. They they see all the different ways you can produce and share content now, and they have a little go at every single one of them, instead of yeah. picking one or two that they think would probably be most beneficial to their company and yeah. the way uh, their potential customers want to engage with them, and just going, right, we are going to commit to this. This is going to be 12, 24, 36 months. We are going to do this for that long, regularly, and that will build up that engagement and the traffic and the, the, the leads, which is what it's all about in the end. It, but far too often, you get people having a little go at a few things and then deciding after. Do you see that again? Yeah, and if you don't have that consistency, then yes, then people aren't going to be engaging with you consistently. Yeah. And they'll very quickly forget about you and go to the company that is producing all the stuff consistently. Yeah, and I think we had, um, it was Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram were down last week, weren't they? And I shared, there was a piece, again, copy blogger, which has always been my um, Bible for content marketing. 2015, Sonia Simone, who's one of their chief writers, wrote about digital share cropping. And if you put all of your content marketing efforts onto Facebook or onto Instagram um, and it goes down, you can lose your entire business. Yeah. You know, Zuckerberg changed the rules and you've lost your entire business, which happens to people. So it always has to be on your site. Yeah. You have to own your site and take control of it. That's my <sighs> These holy, holy grail of these digital silos. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some interesting proposals out there about taking your data out. So even if you're posting it on, uh, if you come across this Tim Berners-Lee's proposal for the, the future of the web, um, for you to have your data in a pod, uh, which is on your computer, and you grant permission to sites like Facebook to access it from your computer. But if they ever go down or disappear, or someone else comes up and you decide you want to move to whatever the new Facebook is, you you just grant them access to the same material because it's yours. 
which I think is a very interesting. That's but um, but yes, getting away from the digital silos is important. I think time is crucial because although the the time scale of your industry, so if it's quite short, you would expect to see results quite quickly from the time someone uh, visits the content. But it takes time to build up your digital presence mm -hmm. to the point that people will actually encounter it for the first time. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say never, never say, well, we're really, really fast paced, so we're going to try it for a week. It, it, will, <laughs> it will never work. Yeah. So the number of people, again, who think, I'm going to start a blog. Mm -hmm. And they just start putting things out on their website, but they don't give any thought to how people might find that information yeah. or how they might track that. No one's going to visit their blog yeah. if no one knows about their blog. Yes. Yes. And, pe and if people aren't searching for the things on it, it will get no traffic at all. So you have to tie that into your, to maybe what you might think of as maybe more technical sides of, uh, you'll need to talk to maybe an SEO um, expert, or maybe it's just the person who does your website, or you'll need to, to think about um, a, a platform that might drive people to yeah. it, for example. Well, I think that that's a key thing. I mean, for years and years, people have been spouting that, that content is king. Mm. And whilst there's a lot to be said for that, yes, it's very important. You'd almost argue that distribution is probably king. It's conversation, isn't it? It's not just broadcast. Yeah, you, you, have to, you have to make sure people see what you've written. And if you're just sticking to your own blog in the early stages, no one will see it, you know, with the best will in the world. If, if you're a brand new blogger or you don't have a website that gets a lot, gets a lot of traffic, while it will slowly drag you up the rankings over time, if you want to see traffic, you're going to have to put it somewhere else. Put it on your own, absolutely own your own content and keep yeah. it there. Yeah. But you should be using platforms like Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook uh, and, and Medium and other places you can place your content, like Converge as well. <laughs> Yeah. I'm not going to mention. <laughs> I'm not going to mention all these other ones, and not mention <laughs> mine. Yeah. Um, and and make sure that your content's being seen by people, but always pointing them back always to back. where you are, and yeah. and taking time as well. I think the, I read something not too long ago where I forget the put the person. They meant they reckoned that you should be spending two to three times as long distributing your content than you ever did writing it in the first place. So if you're taking two hours to produce a piece, you should be spending six hours yeah. distributing it to social media or yeah, other blog that. platforms to make sure people see it. It's, it's, I guess it's the same as someone spending a fortune doing up a bricks and mortar shop and makes it look fantastic, but never tells anyone that, they've, yeah. that they're there. Outside. Opens the door and wonders why no one's walking in. You know, you, say, you have to spend time putting what you've done in front of people? I would, I would say more, more important even than getting the, the um, get, get putting time into content marketing or, or making sure the distribution is right, is making sure that what you're saying is right. Mm -hmm. That what, what, what your, your message is as a business is, is the right point. Yeah. Because you can spend a lot of time saying the wrong thing yeah. and, and it won't work because you're, you're telling, you're, you're, maybe you're portraying yourself as something you're not, or maybe the, the key value you thought you had wasn't what it, it actually was, so, and which are business questions. So who are our audience really, and what is the value they really experience in the thing that we're doing? Uh, and that has to then drive the, con the, 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 uh, the content agenda, yeah. as in so it's about relationships and about people at the end of the day. So if you're a law firm struggling because all of your content is dry and you've, you're just repeating the same thing over and over again, it's not that you need to push that harder. Mm. It's the wrong thing yeah. to be saying, be or, or it's the wrong channel. Yeah. Yeah. So you need a blog that tells you how to deal with probate, yeah. uh, but you don't necessarily need, it, no one is going to follow you because 20 times a day you post, we exist, we are firm, come and talk to one of us, list. that is not going to help. Yeah. And it's, it's, it gives no value to the individual at the other end. Yeah. So with having so much changed in terms of how people view content marketing over the years, you know, initially it was get as much content as you can out there, get the backlinks, Google will reward you for that. That's quick, that's become, actually it's quality over quantity now. I think the, the average number one ranking blog posts for any topic is over two and a half thousand words or around two and a half thousand words. 
there's obviously a lot of video content that's being produced these days. What do you think may change in the future? Where do you see content marketing going? Again, it applies differently to different sectors, but there's clearly right now a push towards video yeah. and longer form written content. So maybe where do we see it going forward, especially with the sort of proliferation of social media channels that people have access to and ways that they can engage with their audiences? Where do you think we might end up in a few years? I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I think we touched on it earlier, which is find the channels that work for you. You can't, unless you've got a massive team behind you, I don't think you can do them all. And I don't think every channel is appropriate mm. for everybody. Um, I think we're getting very good at sort of rather than the whole chicken. This is always, I always bring food into something. It's rather than the whole chicken, it's the chicken nugget. Or you might have space for a bit of breast, a bit of thigh, but you can't digest the whole thing in, at once but you might save it for later and come back to it. And visually, Instagram's not stopping, is it? Instagram's not going anywhere anytime soon. And it's probably for the younger generation of marketers gonna take over Twitter. Whereas Twitter, I think, is the best place to disseminate the longer form articles. Yeah. That's where I find the good stuff and LinkedIn to some extent as well. It does feel everything's shifting towards a sort of more image heavy content than maybe written at the minute. Although I think that has also, in contrast, led to people wanting, being a bit more uh, savvy about where they consume their written mm -hmm. content. They want the longer form, they want the more in-depth stuff because they now can get the really quick stuff via video yeah. and tweets and Instagram updates. They can get all the really quick stuff they want from there. Now they're looking at articles, the written stuff. Sure they really want to get into it, I think. I don't know what you think, maybe. I think video is, is synchronous and written content is asynchronous because you have, as a, as a watcher or a reader, if you're watching a video, you pretty much have to start at the beginning and go through it, um, which means that the person who put the video together is 100% in control of what you see, when you see it, um, possibly what you hear, or you can mute, mute it, but, but they're in control, they're in the driving seat and you're along for the ride, mm. which means you have the potential for greater engagement, but you also, it's, it's sort of, it's hidden. It's slightly out of your control, mm. which means I think it only works for certain kinds of things that you might want to say. Yeah. You have to be able to express them in a very short amount of time because people are not happy being out of control for too long. I think that's why long form video content doesn't work because people are like, well, I don't know what you're going to say. I th it's been interesting so far, but actually I'm a bit bored and I'm gonna move on. It's not that people have short attention spans, it's they don't want to give up control for that long, I think. And one of the great things about written content, which only it can do, is that you put the user in the driving seat and you can give them visual cues of headings and images and bullet points and things that tell them what the structure of what it is they're reading and let them skip ahead to the end and then back to the beginning and have a look and see if there's anything relevant for them. Or skim read through. Or skim read, mm -hmm. which you can't yet do, I think, with, it's fair to say, with, with video. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, therefore, you can't really compare synchronous and asynchronous communication in the same way you can't compare telephone and email. Yeah. So email is yeah. asynchronous. You can send it whenever you want. Telephone is synchronous. You, you're on at the same time. Uh, and, and it really suits certain kinds of conversations, yeah. but email's much better for others. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about saying video versus, it's a really long answer to it, it's quite straightforward, but I think oh, really video versus long form written content, they, they're they not the same thing. And so it's not about um, video triumphing over written content. There was that scandal, wasn't there, where Facebook vastly uh, overestimated the effectiveness of video mm -hmm. in the statistics that they were giving to people who were using their platform, mm -hmm. that it's actually much less effective than they were thinking. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of video. I'm not, I'm not doing it down. But, but what I'm saying is I wouldn't see if there's some kind of massive trend and that the article is disappearing. Um, I think it's more that we're, we're discovering the possibilities of video, yeah. but the article, uh, long form content isn't going anywhere. I would say as well, we're kind of in the same phase with video right now as we were with articles 10 years ago, yeah. where we had people producing 
blogs for the sake of producing blogs and now people may be producing video for the sake of producing video and eventually we'll get maybe video to the point where we are with written articles which is people want that they're far more savvy about where they consume their content they don't just read anything they distill down to the sources that they trust the most yeah. and they prefer more in-depth stuff so that's probably maybe where we're going with video and, and perhaps with with other mediums that you know podcasting for example that's a big one yeah. um that's far more sort of conducive to people sitting in their car and a commute though and mm. listening to the full thing for an yeah, hour. Yeah, it's passive, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, I think with video as well, and I'm finding this with, with, I'm getting more script work, which is interesting. The bigger companies are realising that this is a way to talk to their, imp and a lot of internal stuff actually. Um, it's a way to communicate messages that people haven't got the patience to sit and read long form explanations on things. Mm. But the work that goes into the script and to making it 90 seconds, 100 seconds, is there's a lot of work goes into make sure that it is engaging mm -hmm. because you can turn off so quickly and you can press stop so quickly. And I know LinkedIn just started LinkedIn Live, didn't they? I don't want LinkedIn to talk to me. I really don't. <laughs> I don't want it to. I get, you know, even I was in the quiet coach on the train last night and all of a sudden Insta stories started oh. <laughs> to me. But that, and if you're just giving me a sound bite, just tell me where you are and show me a photograph. I don't want to invest 10 seconds of... It sounds awful, doesn't it? But it, if it's just noise, shush, tell me something that's useful. And, and actually, if I find a long-form piece of content, I print them off. I'm so old school. I print them off and I circle and I star and I find the bits that I want so that I can go back to them. And I've got a swipe file in the office of good stuff, you know, tone of voice stuff, sales letter stuff. It is good quality content that I keep. But that is in it's hard form. It's value yeah. for both video and written content. So the reason you don't want that ten seconds on um, on LinkedIn is is not that it's not uh, it's not that it's too long. It, it's it's that it's not giving you anything yeah. of value. Yeah. And I think and and James, you were alluding to sort of I think the sort of black hat practices when people were throwing out blogs yes. in every possible variation of a phrase, blue shoes, red shoes, white shoes uh, type thing, yeah. uh, not actually writing different content, but just spinning it out into lots and lots of things. Whereas with uh, growing skill in artificial intelligence and in being able to um, teach machines to distinguish between good and bad and analyze the data, we're getting to a point where the search engine's objectives can become a reality. And the objective of any search engine is to connect its, a user mm -hmm. to the most valuable and relevant content as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. that's, that's their objective. That's the best experience for the user. Mm -hmm. If they have to scroll through pages and pages of results, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. What they want, they want people to be, item number one is exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah. And so fluff articles that follow the rules uh, that are, have clickbaity headlines, but nothing really relevant, they will ultimate, they might enjoy a temporary surge uh, as people figure some way to, to game the system. Yeah. Um, but they're not going to survive long term because it's in everyone's interest that they don't. Mm -hmm. We all want value yeah. out of our search experience and value out of our video experience. Mm -hmm. So the best way to ensure your content stays at the top of a page is to provide genuine value for the people who are interested in that thing. Mm -hmm. And by providing the best content, the most useful content, you, you'll stay there. Well, I think that's a really good place to, to end the conversation. It's a good point to end on. Um, so thank you both very much for, for taking part. Thank you.